Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I thank the scientific program committee and the organizers of this meeting for inviting me today to do this presentation on the therapeutic options of starting antiretroviral therapy. So before we start any antiretroviral therapy, as a clinician, we need to know that for patients with HIV, because of the drop in the CD4 cell count, they can acquire various opportunistic infections like herpes zoster, they can develop a tuberculosis, they can develop oropharyngeal candidiasis, and the CD4 is less than 200. They also can develop various other opportunistic infections like pneumocystis pneumonia, CNS toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis meningitis, cytomegaloviral retinitis, and toxoplasmosis, which has been very common when the CD4 is less than 100, and also cryptococcal meningitis. So as a clinician, first our charge is to diagnose these opportunistic infections. And if they have anything, we need to manage them before we initiate anyone on antiretroviral therapy. And also the studies have shown patients can have one or more opportunistic infection when they present to care. So today we have a guidelines from the World Health Organization for advanced HIV disease based on the CD4 cell count to do prophylaxis and also targeted related uh, investigations to rule out various opportunistic infections. This is very important before we start anyone on antiretroviral therapy. Also, the natural history studies have shown many of those opportunistic infections play a critical role in causing HIV disease progression. Hence, as a clinician, we need to manage them before we initiate someone on antiretroviral therapy. Coming to the antiretroviral drugs, these are the various uh, ARVs today approved by the US FDA and being available in most of the lower and middle income countries. And you may ask a question, what to choose when someone present to care and also when to give these antiretroviral therapy to those individuals. There are uh, various clinical trials done in the past. These are the two landmark studies, one called HPT and O52, another one START study. So these two clinical trials are being, being carried out both in the developed world as well as in developing countries to answer the critical question whether starting antiretroviral therapy to everyone, whether prevents various opportunistic infections, prevent non-communicable diseases, prevent HIV-related morbidity and mortality, and as well as, as well as sexual transmission of HIV. The studies are very clearly shown at these antiretroviral drugs, starting at a higher CD4 cell count soon after the diagnosis, prevents various opportunistic infections and thereby you'll have enormous individual health benefit as well as prevent sexual transmission to their uninfected partners by reducing the viral load, thereby you have a huge public health benefit in prevention. We do have guidance from WHO, someone present to you care with any symptoms of HIV. So what you should do is you should look for these opportunistic infections and diagnose them and manage them, start on treatment, then start on antiretroviral therapy. Again, the time duration should be around seven days. You start on anti-opportunistic infections, drugs, stabilize the patients, then start on ART, what is called rapid antiretroviral initiation. It's called rapid ART. But someone who has got any central nervous system manifestations like cryptococcal meningitis or toxoplasmosis or, CB, or TB meningitis, you can delay the initiation of antiretroviral therapy up to six weeks to prevent immune reconstitution syndrome. In all the other conditions, initiate antiretroviral drugs within seven days and link to treatment. For someone presented to care, they're totally asymptomatic. They do not have any opportunistic infections. You diagnose them today, counsel them about the antiretroviral medications. If they're prepared, you can even initiate antiretroviral therapy on the same day. There are studies being done in Africa as well as other lower and middle income countries doing this can prevent loss to follow up and thereby people will have enormous benefit following this antiretroviral therapeutics. This is what is called same day initiation of antiretroviral therapy. So these are those various recommendations given by WHO for initiating you know, treatment. So the recommendation is done in the year 2019 and subsequently it was also been readapted in 2021 by the World Health Organization and the guidelines have been used in lower and middle income countries. So today who's been HIV positive? So you need to choose a regimen which has got a tenofovir, lemivudine, or emtricitabine with the doctor to initiate therapy. So you need to choose a drug which should fit for all populations. People who have got tuberculosis, one of the most common opportunistic infections people living with HIV, someone who has been pregnant, 
and also with other comorbid conditions. Various studies have shown where someone with a combination with tenofovir, lemivudine, or imtasivin, daltegravir is a preferred choice. In regions who do not, where you don't have a daltegravir or you cannot give daltegravir, efavirin 400 can be given as an alternate therapy based on the NCORE clinical trials. In the past, we had used a combination of tenofovir, lemivudine, and efavirin for 600 milligrams, which is now being not recommended anymore, only in certain population because of various uh, you know, toxicities and as well as baseline in an arterial persistence. But also WHO has also recommended in certain special population where you can also use a newer drug called tenofovir alafenamide, where persons who have got high risk to develop toxicities following you know, tenofovir. Now why this efavirenz containing therapy, which we had used a lot in the past, had been moved out of the guidelines, is based on this very nice retrospective study, which was carried out on four ACTG NIH funded clinical trials, which compared uh, regimens which did not use uh, efavirenz versus efavirenz and showed that patients who had used efavirenz containing regimens have got 2.6 fold increase in suicidality as compared to non efavirenz containing therapy. And these trials are done in different parts of the world, including in Asia, in India, as well as in, in, in Thailand. WHO does uh, uh, resistance surveillance uh, every year. Um, uh, they do sentinel surveillance um, in different sites. And the survey very clearly shows that the baseline NNRTA, that is resistance to nevirepine and efavirenz, is rising in developing countries. You can see this has been going beyond 10%, as well as in our region, it's almost been reaching you know, 10%. So also WHO has given a guidance in regions where they have uh, national prevalence of uh, pretreatment HIV drug resistance to NNRTA is 10% and more. Use non-NNRTA containing antiretroviral therapy, preferably a daltegravir containing you know, regimen to initiate it. And again, you may ask a question, why daltegravir when we have protease inhibitors and as well as other um, integrase inhibitors this is again based on extensive daltegravir clinical program experience from various clinical trials. The studies uh, Sinkel, Flamingo, Spring, and Sailing, all these results have been pulled and have shown daltegravir could be a preferred choice. So if you look into this particular uh, slide, uh, where it shows the outcome of the single trial, which compared a combination of uh, uh, tenofovir, emtricidabine, and efavirenz versus a bacavir, lemivudine, and daltegravir. Um, the x-axis is patients in duration of follow-up and y-axis is proportion of people who have got a suppressed viral load. This yellow color curve is from patients who received efavirenz containing therapy and uh, lighter color curve is patients who received daltegravir containing therapy. This very clearly shows that daltegravir is superior in terms of virological suppression, so over a period of time as compared to in efavirenz. Also, if you see this viral DK, the patients who are on daltegravir containing therapy, they got a uh, much earlier virological uh, suppression, which is very important for the prevention effect as compared to, you know, efavirenz as shown in this particular uh, slide. Also, some analysis have shown uh, daltegravir has got a fewer uh, side effects as compared to efavirenz, uh, which has got a more of CNS side effects and uh, where dreams and, uh, and uh, you know, various other CNS uh, toxicities been, you know, reported. And also, Similar observations were also been seen in the other clinical trials where they have used daltegravir versus raltegravir, which has shown daltegravir is non-inferior, non it's been once daily, and raltegravir is twice daily. And also Flamingo is a study which compared daranavir 800 milligram boosted with ritonavir 100 milligram against daltegravir, where daltegravir very clearly showed in this Flamingo trial, which is superior as compared to uh, daranavir. And also, um, uh, daltegravir has also been used in various experienced patients, which very clearly shows that it's been much uh, superior. Can we give this daltegravir in populations who have got a tuberculosis? And again, uh, studies have been done. This is one of the very early study called Inspiring Study to look at the pharmacokinetics of daltegravir and rifampicin interactions, where this particular study very clearly shows that if you are giving a rifampicin along with uh, daltegravir, you have to double the dose of uh, daltegravir from 50 milligram once daily to twice daily to get the therapeutic uh, drug concentration to suppress his uh, viral load. But when you have been giving efavirenz in the past, you don't need to do this dose modification. Here in daltegravir, you have to double the dose. If you are using a combination of FTC of tenofovir, lemivudine, daltegravir, 
you may also have to add another extra 50 milligram dosage of doltegravir along with rifampicin to get a therapeutic concentration. Can you give these doltegravir in pregnant women? Sapamo is a large observational study, which has been an ongoing study in Botswana, which is a pregnancy registry where they capture all those women who became pregnant while on any type of antiretroviral therapy, where doltegravir in the past have shown some signals on neural tube defects, uh, especially among women who have initiated on the first trimester. And subsequent reports very clearly shows that it's been quite safe. This NTD prevalence among these women who received doctor at conception has been lower than that being initially been signaled. Thereby, now it's been clearly recommended among all populations and including in pregnant women or women who want, wanted to become you know, pregnant to initiate on Dr. Guru containing therapy. Coming to the cost, when this Dr. Guru was launched four years back, it was been prohibitively expensive as compared to favorites. So we, our group conducted a, a cost effectiveness studies using a CPEC model in collaboration with the Harvard University, where uh, we have shown at that time a generic Doltegravir regimen for first line um, in my country of India will increase survival and decrease the proportion of patients switching to more costly second line ART. At that time, we modeled that uh, $102 per year per patient will be very cost effective when it is available um, in a generic market. And today the cost has been much lower, is been is around $70 you know, you know, uh, per year. So now today we do have a, a generic doltegravir uh, um, uh, uh, in the last um, uh, four to five years. And we also have shown uh, in the studies showing that uh, the safety tolerability and efficacy of uh, generic doltegravir, which has been safe and been comparable uh, with the innovators and thereby we provide support for a large scale transition to Dr. Grover as part of the first line you know, regimens. Uh, you may ask a question, what about other enterprise inhibitors like Black to Grover, which again, many of you have got rich experience, been, been present for quite some time, l to Grover and l to Grover. So Royal to Grover is one which has got a longest experience, but it has been twice daily. There is no co-formulation available. Again, as you know, that as a clinicians, our patients prefer a, fixed dose combination for a better adherence. And coming to the Elvitagravir, it's not widely available. It's available as a single tablet regimen, but requires a drug called Cobicistat, which also can produce several drug-drug interactions, and, but this drug has been once daily. Daltagravir has got a lot of advantages, very high genetic barrier, few drug interactions, can be given in rifampicin, but you need to alter the dosage of Daltagravir. It's also been active against other uh, uh, integral-resistant viruses, and also been co-formulated and been available along with the Bacavir and Lemivudine, also along with the Tenofovir and TAF with either Lemivudine or Entricinibin. But on the other hand, uh, there is a, a small proportion of this one of weight gain, particularly in uh, women in Sub-Saharan Africa when it has been compared with the TAF. Bictagravir used a lot in, um, in the developed world as a co-formulated of TAF, uh, Entricinibin and uh, Bictagravir. It's available as a single tablet regimen high genetic barrier, but it cannot be given in TB uh, patients where they receive rifampicin, as well as uh, uh, there is a data lack in, uh, in, in pregnant women. For these reasons, a combination with adultigravir is much more attractive, particularly in lower and middle income countries where they have a high risk of developing tuberculosis and for uh, pregnant women, and also with the wider uh, availability as a fixed dose uh, combination. So following all these various studies and availability of medications, now Daltegravir has been rolled out across many parts of the world in lower and middle income countries. Again, in our region, a uh, lot of progress had happened. Uh, this is a data till uh, 2021, um, except in some parts where uh, most of the part is shown by the green color uh, shadows, uh, Daltegravir has been getting you know, rolled out. Uh, coming to when you start someone on tenofovir, you know, which patients can also develop uh, renal dysfunction, uh, this is one of our study, earlier study, the cumulative uh, prevalence of tenofovir dysfunction in Southern India is around 5.6%. And this data is also supported by a yeah, cohort study uh, from Treat Asia from across all Asian countries have shown tenofovir on a long run uh, can produce uh, you know, renal dysfunction and close monitoring of creatinine has been very important. It's been strongly recommended every six to 12 months of creatinine monitoring after initiating treatment. Hence, for populations who have high risk to develop a renal toxicity, also tenofovir can also produce bone mineral density loss, where TAF is also been recommended 
as a, um, um, in a special population. Again, coming to what is this staph? So this is tenophore alafanamide, which is a prodrug of tenophore. When someone swallows uh, tenophore alone, it doesn't get absorbed, it gets excreted. But on the other hand, as a prodrug of uh, tenophore uh, desproxyl femoride as 300 milligram, it is a fixed dose combination, get absorbed. Uh, a small proportion of them goes to the target uh, uh, lymphocyte to suppress the virus replication, but larger part of the drug get excreted through the renal tubular cell function, causing damage to the renal tubular cells. Uh, but on the other hand, TAF, tenafor alafenamide, in a smaller dosage of 25 milligram, and there were larger proportion of that uh, goes to the target site to inhibit the HIV replication, but a small proportion portion of them get excreted as a renal tubular cell function, causing a yes, small proportion of the renal damage. Hence, for this reason, tenophore on a long run can be renal toxic as compared to tenophore uh, alafenamide. Also, various studies have shown from different carried out clinical trials comparing tenophore versus uh, uh, TAF. Here are shown by orange color in tenophore and the purple as uh, uh, tenophore alafenamide, where if you see this particular slide on the left side of your panel, where this is a quantitation of proteinuria, it is very clearly shows that over a period of time, patients develop uh, proteinuria and on the right side, albuminuria with tenofovir, and which, which is better with these uh, tenofovir alafenamide. That is clearly showing that on a long run, tenofovir can be renal toxic. Also in clinical trials uh, where uh, various subsidies have been carried out, trying to understand the bone mineral density last following tenofovir, but again, if you see these, this is a DEXA scan has been carried out where you can see the sex codes where uh, orange is the patients who are on tenofovir and the purple is on uh, tenofovir alafenamide. The left side panel is on the spine and right side on the hip. You see this both on the spine as well as the hip. Patients who are on tenofovir containing therapy have a higher bone mineral density loss as compared to tenofovir alafenamide. It's been seen both the spine as well as the hip and they've been showing it's also been bone toxic on a long run. For these reasons, now we have tenofovir alafenamide available. Hence, you may ask a question, can we substitute or initiate all patients um, on tenofovir alafenamide instead of uh, uh, tenofovir? Again, we do not have good data on the interactions with, of TAF with our fantasy, hence not recommended in TB patients. Also, there is a data lack in, a, in, in, a, in pregnant women. Uh, and over the top, that is, uh, this is a very nice study carried out in sub-Saharan Africa called advanced study where this is a three-arm study on patients initiating treatment which compared tenofovir emtazidabine uh, efavirenz versus tenofovir emtazidabine doltegravir versus TAF emtazidabine and doltegravir. And the clinical trial uh, very clearly showed on a very large number of patients that all the three regimens are comparable in terms of virological suppression. And they did a sub-analysis on looking into the weight change where patients who are on doltegravir regimens, they have a higher weight gain both in men as well as in women as compared to the fibrins containing population. So, but on the other hand, again, patients who are on TAF containing therapy, they got a higher weight gain as compared to uh, tenofovir containing therapy, particularly in women where further made more studies on that. Similar observations were also been seen in our country of India, in our own cohort in Chennai, where in the first 12 months, there is an increase in the weight gain seen in both with Doltegravir as well as with fibrins, but subsequently those uh, weight gains are not been seen. Also, there are new onset of diabetes as well as hypertriglycemia has also been observed in certain cohorts, where again in our region of Asia, where there's a high prevalence of diabetes, particularly in HIV infected people need further evaluation in the context of Doltegravir. Now, can we change all those patients who are already on efavirenz um, uh, to uh, Doltegravir containing therapy? Again, if you're doing viral load, definitely you can do that. Even if you don't do a viral load, now we have studies have shown uh, Nadia study, which is on carried out on patients uh, who have been failing uh, NNRT containing therapy, where again they have recycled tenofovir for second line along with the doltegravir, where it have very clearly shows that you know it's been uh, suppressing the viral load. Thereby, even if someone who's on efavirenz containing therapy, better to do a viral load and change, even if you do not have change just for, for programmatic easiness in your countries. So, can we drop a drug like tenofovir when someone have high risk of toxicities? is what is called dual therapy. There are various trials being carried out, particularly for maintenance, but there are also studies being carried out to initiate treatment. I'm just showing a study called Gemini study, where patients who are initiating treatment, they have been viral load of less than 500,000 copies. 
They were randomized into two groups. One group received a triple therapy with tenofovir and tristamine, daltegravir. Another group just received two drugs of daltegravir and 3DC. It's a 144 week study. The 48 week analysis very clearly shows that both regimens are being comparable. Now, following this, USFDA you know, approved this regimen in the name of the VATO in 2019 and also been well supported by other studies, even in patients who have got baseline lemividine resistant, as shown in the SALSA study, very recently presented at the CRI, showed that the regimen of uh, daltegravir 3DC has been uh, uh, suppressed the viral load and can be used as a switch transient when someone who has been initiated on already on tenofovir, lemividine, or interstavine in daltegravir. It's also been available generically in lower and middle income country. It's been recommended in patients who have got suppressed viral load. I suggest to do a repeat viral load after you put them someone on two drug therapy within two to three months. Not um, recommended in hepatitis B co-infected patients as well as in TB patients because we do not have good data on this. So what population will be beneficial out of that? Especially in people who have got suppressed viral load, who have got a high risk of developing renal dysfunction where a two drug combination will be helpful. Patients who have got osteoporosis and also the elderly patient, menopausal women, again, in our region, significant number of our patients with HIV, they are becoming elderly because we have been initiating treatment for quite some time where these two drug regimen of and lemividine, particularly if they have been suppressed, will be really beneficial. Also now, we do have a long-acting injectable as a cabotegor or ilfibrin, the form of cabinova being approved by USFDA, especially for maintenance therapy, but already initiated on other regimen who got a suppressed viral load. Capitagravir and Rilpivirin is being available as the long-acting injectable. The Latte study have shown every uh, eight weeks uh, uh, injectable uh, of Capitagravirin helps in maintaining suppressing the viral load on people who got suppressed, which is also supported by uh, studies from uh, Atlas and, and FLAIR. Also, we do have a lot of newer regimens now coming up. Particularly, there is a drug called Latravir, currently under development. Also, a drug called Doravirin, where again, driver head study have shown can be a better first line options, but we need a little more data from lower and middle income countries, particularly in the context of tuberculosis and as well as in pregnancy. And we do have a newer drug coming up. It's a capsid inhibitor called Linacapavir. Recently, there are uh, good data being presented, uh, which are being done on patients uh, who have been initiating treatment. This is a very novel capsid inhibitor, which can work again against other resistant viruses. The studies carried out in the naive population uh, have shown already been uh, comparable as compared to triple therapy. And also this drug is also being developed as a subcutaneous injectable of every six months. And recent data, which has been uh, presented at the recent CRI at week 54, have uh, very clearly shows that someone who got a suppressed viral load maintenance with a subcutaneous linacapur every six months, along with other drug, uh, you know, maintains a virological, you know, suppression. I'm going to end my talk stating that today we have got a lot of regimens being available, but choose what is good to the patients depending upon their background illness and their age. And also, uh, don't just forget those patients. You have to closely monitor them, not only with the CD4 and viral load, but also for the toxicities. We do have now strategies to drop the drugs, thereby reduce the side effects of the medications. And also, there are a lot of newer uh, regions coming up. It's time that we need to look into to substitute them. Also, we do have long-acting preparations available, which again might be an answer in future for patients who have got problems with adherence. With this, I'll stop my talk and I'll be happy to take questions. Again, thank you again for this opportunity.